Hello all you hardcore boxing fans out there, how are you doing? It's Big P here, you know don't you, you know. Well, we've got a treat for you today, all them emails that you keep sending me, asking for the return of Terry. Uh, we've got Terry live on the channel now from London. Terry the Banker we're going to call you and uh, and trainer from Fitzroy Lodge. <laughs> Terry, uh, from, Terry from the Lodge, is that better Terry? Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> I've jotted a few things down here. There's about 30 questions here, and I thought I'd let somebody else give their opinion instead of me. So we'll, we'll fly through them. Uh, first of all, I want to call this video, or this little bit what we're talking about, the Dillian White myth. Is it a myth, Terry? That we're um, called? Okay, so so we need to we need to be clear about what we mean by the myth. So oh, the myth, the world level myth. No, I don't think it's a myth, and I'll explain why, Russ. Go on. Now, if you look at Povetkin, right, and let's say Povetkin's peak years were about ten, eleven years ago. Yeah. He was fringe world level then, right? He was like kind of you had to be Povetkin to to say you're world level. Let's be honest. Yeah. That's where he was at. We're now in 2020, and Povetkin is world level. He's, what, top five with all the governing bodies? Yeah. So I think what we've seen, actually, is what we have to class as world level has declined over the years. Because it's not that long ago that Povetkin was fighting guys like Eddie Chambers and being outclassed. I know he won eventually, but, you know, Eddie Chambers wasn't really that dedicated at that point. He was fighting guys like Chambers and Chris Bird, and they were just giving him nightmares. And here you have Povetkin touching 41, and he's able to compete at world level in terms of the people we class as being able to fight for world titles. I think it's you that said last week that, you know, Huey Fury is at that level where he deserves a chance. And so if we're benchmarking against that, then, you know, Povetkin is world level, but he's old and these aren't his best years. So I think we're just, we're just in a really poor era of yeah. heavyweights that have just been really well marketed to the fans. Do you think that, uh, well, I'll go through these questions because all that what I was just about to ask is in the questions. Right, we'll go fly through them then. Question one, so you've answered Dillian White at the myth. Question two, been knocked out twice now. Johnny Nelson, Gareth A. Davis and a lot of other people are coming out saying it was a lucky punch. But we're talking about a gold medalist here, former world champion, aren't we? That's not a lucky punch. That's not a lucky punch. You, you could see he was setting something up on that left-hand side from the beginning of the fight. He kept going to the body. You know, almost like, even if he missed, he didn't care. He was always going to the body. And so, what that, de what that did is, eventually, especially as Dillian started to tire, which he did around round four, round five, it forced Dillian to now start to protect the body a bit more. And when he did that, it opened up the gate for a shot. So, at that point, Povetkin could have come with a left hook or he could have come with the left uppercut. The genius of the punch he threw at you, Russ, was that left uppercut was, was the quickest punch he could throw. Because I don't know if you've watched it back, but the shape that Dillian was making was a similar shape to the one that he made when he knocked out Chisora. You know, that little you know, dip to your left, come up and just swing that heavy punch. But Povetkin just got to him before he could let one go. I just think that's what happens when you've had 130-odd amateur bouts. You've been in every gym. You've been in every possible fight situation. And remember, Povetkin's boxed every possible style. Like, you're looking at Chris Bird. Chris Bird is a southpaw who came up from 75 in the amateurs to win a heavyweight title. I know it was a bit lucky. Then you're fighting someone like Eddie Chambers, who, who likes to stay in range, a counterpunch. And, you know, you're all the way through to guys like Vladimir Klitschko, who's just jab, jab, hold. Povetkin's seen it all. So there's nothing Dillian's going to present to him he's never seen. Yeah. What about uh, a lot's been made of, I've been watching all interviews last night and this morning, uh, Cole Whirl and that Xavier Miller and other people saying that Sam Jones, that Dylan White's still got that uh, uh, problem where he leans over from, from the Joshua fight, where you know where he's le leaning in or whatever. You'll probably know it better than me. But when he knocked Chisora out, he was leaning in, wasn't he? So that yeah, yeah, so yeah. he commits all of that weight 
yeah. to that front leg. And then he just stands up off that leg. And the power required to shift that weight means he can just pivot into a hook straight away. So it's like that dip, come up and just detonate that hook. Strange how no one's ever said that about Dave Allen, but Dave Allen does the same thing. Mm. You know, Dave's always in front of the shot, people. aren't they? Yeah, they're just getting that maximum leverage. Yeah. So basically, he got the maximum leverage in the Chisora fight. He got away with it in that fight, but he didn't get away with it with Povetkin. He got punished, didn't he? He got punished because Povetkin just found the quickest way to the chip, which yeah. was the uppercut, just bam. Do you feel that all these interviews that have just popped up on IFL this morning from the, the usual suspects, Gareth A. Davis and all the rest of the matchroom rimmers, do you think that, uh, that Povetkin is not getting enough credit? And that they're saying that it was Dillian's fight to lose? What, what, your, what do you think? Because if, if the roles were, were reversed... What we will be saying now, we'll be talking about Dillian as like the comeback guy, won't we, and all that, and the can man and all that, won't we? Anyone who wants wants it can get it. Well, the vet can didn't get so, it. So, so here, you know, everyone's trying to keep money in the franchise, right? Yeah. So we know what the fans saw because we, we saw it ourselves. Yeah. We saw someone get put down and knocked out by a 40-year-old man. That's never a well, good look. in too weak. Yeah, you know. Imagine Mike Tyson had been knocked out by Larry Holmes. It's that sort of feeling where you're like, that shouldn't happen. Yeah. So, so now they realize that you still need Dillian to sell your pay-per-view. So this has to be seen as a, a fluke. But it wasn't a fluke. Because let's not forget, how many times was Kovetkin down against Klitschko? And he still made it to the end of the fight. He's yeah. a very hard man to stop. Yeah, do you feel and, that... Yeah, yeah, you're, right, you're exactly right. He is a hard man to stop, isn't he? Yeah. And then look, who, who has stamina issues going down the stretch? Dillian. So you're telling me it's inconceivable that Povetkin could have just ridden that storm out, got to rounds 8, 9, and 10, and then just hammered it. You know, I think Dillian had to stop it inside six. If it went longer than that, I was worried for him. This is before the fight. I thought Povetkin would take it down the stretch just because of Dillian's stamina issues. Do you think, Terry, that the signs were there that Dillian were going to get beat because Parker dropped him, Rivers dropped him, Joshua knocked him out? And, and you know, he is a bit wide open at times because he puts everything into the, his shots. Do you think the signs were there that eventually it would come a cropper? We're not fighting for world titles, but still wanting these pay-per-views. So I thought it would come against Ortiz. I didn't think it would come against Povetkin because... Yeah. It didn't need to. He already had Povetkin down twice. Yeah. And it's almost like, I don't know, I didn't really pay attention to what was said in the corner, but from what I'm hearing, he was told to back off. But Dillian's not a back off sort of guy. Dillian's a, if I can get it done now, I'll get it done now. And so there's obviously something wrong in the corner. And you can't say it's lack of experience with Caldwell because he's been there long enough. I think it's a lack of top level pedigree in that corner. So Dave Caldwell, I can't think of a win that Caldwell has where he's been in the corner and it's one of his guys has beaten a genuinely world-class fighter. I can't, you know, I Dave, can't tell you. Yeah, Dave Caldwell's still dining out on Bell, you beating one-legged Hank. Let's be honest. Yeah. That's what he's still dining out on. I genuinely think if, if Smedley had been in that corner, he'd have done a better job than Caldwell. And well, Smedley hasn't really been seen for a while. Well, let's break it down then, right? Dave Caldwell's best win as a trainer is a, la is a Lungo Macabo, right? And he won a world champion at the time. He did go on to win a vacant belt. But that's his best win as a trainer. Other than that, he's known for Ryan Rhodes being fed to Canelo. Uh, David Price being fed to whoever. He got knocked out on his shift. He worked with Shizora. That didn't work out. He, he's like the guy that you go to like a mini Adam Booth. It? When people get beat, they all say, go to Adam Booth, he's the best, the Dark Lord, or Darth Vader, whatever they call him. And now it seems to be, whoever can get you an olive branch to Eddie Earn. that's what I think. And I think they played the soft option. They brought him in. Now, what other fighter, what other TV company would give somebody who's having a small role to play 
in the corner. It reminded me of when Angelo Dundee came in and did did the similar role for Oscar De La Hoya. That didn't work against Mayweather, did it? It was the same sort of carry-on where they bigged it up. They made it about Caldwell, not Miller. Now, fair enough. I'm not going to say too much about the Miller situation, but he was the trainer on the night, wasn't he? But it were took away from him. It were made about Caldwell's entrance, wasn't it? Because everyone thought that would be decisive. You know, how, the problem Sky have, Porks, and you know this, is they love to sell stories. Like, yeah. they, they, realize, they realize most people who watch boxing don't have a fucking clue about anything. No, they don't. So they, so, so they sell the story. They try and make it like a soap opera. This has been their, their strategy from Hey Harrison. They'd sell it as a soap opera. We'll give you all the story. We'll tell you what size jeans this boxer wears. We'll tell you what color socks he wore to the press conference. All that irritating stuff, right? Because if you ever notice, when they try and talk about the boxing, they go incredibly quiet because they don't have much to say. Yeah. So they've, they've, they've built this industry, building up these stories. So Dave Caldwell, familiar face to Sky viewers. Oh, my God, Dave Caldwell's coming in. It's like Superman, isn't it? Oh, Superman's yeah, Superman. here. Penfold. Yeah, he's here. Danger Mouse. Danger Mouse. Yeah. But look, if Xavier Miller's been in Portugal for all of these months, Dave Caldwell needed to sit back and let Dillian listen to the voice that he's been listening to for five months. Because, I, and I'm not saying Dillian was under pressure, but when you need someone to have a stern word with you, you want a voice that's familiar. That's why I was surprised he got rid of Mark Tibbs so soon. Like, I mean, you should have at least had a plan of succession for that one. I, I think between rounds four and five, I think Mark and Jimmy Tibbs would have said something like, you've put him down twice, but just watch out. A wounded fight is a dangerous fight, so he might try an uppercut. I imagine the Tibbs guys would have said something like that then Dillian wouldn't, wouldn't have been so reckless. Yeah. Just see it out for a round or two, get him under control again, and then we'll put the pressure back on. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was thinking. Do you think that uh, when Dillian had those dark moments at the end of the Rivers fight and backing up the end of the Parker fight, do you think that Mark Tibbs and Jimmy Tibbs said the right things to him, to him and got him over the line? And do you think that this time... There, were, there wasn't that experience in the corner. Because the, um, somebody's saying there were conflicting things about things that were said in the corner. I've seen it on IFL today. I'm trying to think who'd said it. Somebody said that somebody was saying one thing and somebody was saying, oh, I think it was Spencer Fearon. Spencer Fearon in a pink hoodie had said, and a, he's going for a funky drunk, funky, funky dread look. On his haircut, Spencer. Now, and I and I agree with him, you know, for once. I agree with him. Although he's not on my Christmas card list just yet. But I agree with what he said. I think that too many people were jockeying for position in the corner. What do you think? There should be one voice in the corner. There you go. And I don't care which voice it is. It's the voice the fighter most trusts, right? It could have even been the, the cut man. I don't care which voice it is. But in a corner, there should be one voice. Now, the corner will speak throughout the round. I think this, I think that. Right? You, you have your conversation. You've got three minutes to get your story straight. And then as soon as that bell goes for the end of the round, one person speaks. That is all. One person speaks. Control your energy. Look, this is what you've done well in this round. This is what we now need to do. Can you do that for me? Yes or no? Okay. Are you sure you can do that? And then the last thing you say to him is, remember that thing we just talked about? Make sure you do it. Bang. That's your minute managed. That's your minute done. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with you. Moving on then, now that we've got that out of the way. Oh, just before we finish that. Uh, oh, yeah, well, I've got this other one wrote down here. We'll save that for later. Right. Thousand Days. I've just seen the IFL, not Coogan, the other people. Well, Coogan mentioned it, but the other people, the Umar, there's another guy. He is a, a Scottish guy. They're interviewing people. And every interview, they're pushing this 1,000 days. Now, if you back up, 1,000 days on the WBC rankings. Gillian White's not mandatory and he's not number one. So why, why are we hearing about this three-year thing and how he's been unlucky and badly done to and he's suing people and all that? Well, I've found tweets which people have sent me from a few years back. He hasn't sued anybody. He's been happy, in my opinion, to be the, the B-side guy at Matchroom, the number two go-to guy, pay-per-view, fighting guys that he should be. I mean, Malcolm Tan, Lucas Brown, Marius Vac, and uh, this guy last night, Povetkin, they're all old men, 40-odd, aren't they? 
So, and, and Dylan's been happy, in my opinion, to just pick up the pay-per-view and not have a title fight. But do you think he's been badly done to? Or is it self-inflicted? Or whose fault is it? Right. This thousand-day thing. Three years they're saying, aren't they, now? Before so, you... <laughs> So people don't really understand. With the WBC, there's a difference between being number one and being mandatory. You can be number four and be mandatory. You know, let, let, let's be clear as well, right? In the WBA, you've got Fraser Kender, who hasn't boxed for about five or six years. Fraser Kender is mandatory whenever he wants to be for whatever the top title is in the WBA. Uh-huh. He's mandatory for that. Right? Because he, he won a court case. After, I think it was after the Chagaya fight. He won a court case. So yeah. he's just waiting for those belts to get unified. Hopefully, you know, Joshua gets all the belts. And then he will say, right, I want to fight Joshua. And then the fight has to happen. So the, being number one means everything and nothing, depending on the governing body. Yeah. Being number one is important in the IBF, because if you are number one, you will fight next. In the WBO, if you are number one, you will fight next. Yeah. They're, yeah. they're the two guys who have their act together. The WBA, the, w, uh, the WBC, no. Nah. And Dillian knew this. Now, now look what's happened to him. He's lost now, so he's no longer mandatory. If he does beat Povetkin in the rematch, he won't be mandatory. He'll have to go up the ladder again. And have you seen the WBC rankings, Porky? Yeah. It's like Wilder's there, Ortiz is there, Usyk's there. That's, that's his path to the top. He ain't, he's going to sack that off. I can see Dillian talking about going the WBA route. That's what I can see happening. I can and see him trying to get Jerry Chisora in again, me. Uh, only if he loses. If, so if he loses the rematch, yeah. No, if, if Dillian loses the rematch, I can see that. But if he wins the rematch, I can see them fast-tracking it. Because if we look at the big picture here, Russ, let's go back two years. Yeah. Right, two years. Fights that, we, fights that we would have said were huge, right? Joshua versus White, the rematch. We would have said, yeah, 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 you know. Yeah, that's a big fight. Big British domestic fight. You're acceptable for what pay-per-view they're serving up, isn't it? Joshua against White. Well, at the rematch, it's a pay-per-view fight. Yeah. We're also looking at Fury versus Joshua. There are all these fights we were looking at, Russ, in terms of we could make them happen. No, I'm in love. It, yeah, and everyone keeps losing. While we wait for these fights to happen, people are getting stopped, people are getting dropped, and slowly but surely, all the money is just draining away because fans are now realising this is a really poor era for heavyweights. Just from a technical and skill perspective, this is really poor. But from a competitive perspective, they're not so willing to fight each other. That's the disappointing could be thing. Best one at lock, couldn't he, really? And he's not defended a belt. And he's only got two title wins. He could be the best of the era. Yeah, well, I'd have to have an argument. Yeah. But look, and, and fair play to Fury, because I think Fury would be competitive in any era. Whether he'd be uh, dominant, I don't know. But he'd be I competitive do, I in do. any era. Uh, Fury against Larry Holmes would have been fantastic. I think he might have just been too big. He's that big, isn't he? But he moves like a gazelle, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. He's, you know, I'm, I'm glad to see you back on the Tyson Fury bandwagon oh, after no, no, John called you out. I'm not on bandwagon, mate. Not at all. But, uh, <laughs> he, he's better than what we're seeing. Now, do you think that Dillian White had been better doing the McKennessy route with the WBC when Howard Eastman was being messed about by Hopkins? McKennessy instructed lawyers and it ended up in court and he won. And he did the same thing with Frotch Calzaghi when Frotch were mandatory. And Calzaghi vacated on the last day, as we know. <laughs> But the um, point I want to make is, do you think Dillian White had been best off seeing it through a, a, a while back, got lawyers involved instead of chatting about it? Because there's talkers and there's smoky bacon okay. walkers, isn't there? All right, so I'm going to ask you a question. Yeah. Who fought for that WBC title that you'd say Dillian's better than in, the, in, the, in these thousand days? Who's Dillian better than? Oh, f- who's, he, who, who's, he, who's he better than? Well, you'd have to say he's not as good as Ortiz, wouldn't you? No, he's definitely not. Ortiz has had two goes at it, and he, he tears Dillian a new one, doesn't he? That's why Dillian never mentioned him. <laughs> Tyson Fury yeah. didn't want to mention Ortiz when it was proposed six years ago. He didn't want to know why, but he kept saying he's in the Who Needs Him club. Eddie Hearn signed him for that reason, didn't he? To keep him away from his guys. Now, yeah. I think there's just Ortiz. I think maybe... 
Dillian's probably on the same line as the security guy who wilder beat what we called now the not Brazil not Brazil the other one Stevan no no there's another one he fought Orchard's for it. Wilder fought another one. I can't think. It's, the name's gone out of my head. But oh, it's, not, it's not Ariola, is it? No, it's the, the it's the other one. Uh, he, he he was a security guy, and he would he would do his. Uh, I'd have to look on my phone. But uh, but the point I want to make is that, uh, in my opinion, Dillian White's playing the victim card, and it's gone on too long now because he's now. He could be two years away from a title shot now and 35 years old. He could have missed the boat. Joshua he, last year. he could have missed the boat. No, he, he should have, for me, to be honest, mate, when they offered him the Joshua fight last year, well, I mean, hindsight's a wonderful thing, but I said it at the time. Take the fight, take the six million quid. Yeah? You have every chance of beating Joshua. But he was like, no, nah, I don't want the rematch clause. I want it on my terms. You know... That's the sign of being badly advised. I think this is one of the challenges you have in boxing, Paul. Washington, Gerard Washington. Uh, would I say nah, Dillian's a little bit better than him, maybe. Do you reckon? Just, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's that not your On what evidence? On what evidence, Terry? Because Washington, right? Let's have a look at where he's at now because he, he was undefeated when he fought Wilder. Dupus and Washington. I put Dillian in that bracket. Dupus and Washington. No, he's not your brother. I'll put him in the Martin since, Annie, but Charlie Martin against Dillian. That could be Dillian's uh, level, mate. I mean, Dillian's yeah. got a British title off Ian Lewinson in a vacant. What else has he done? People can't keep telling me that Dillian White is world level. I'm not having it. He's been dropped by Oscar Rivers, who not done anything. Dropped by Parker, who fluked an own win against Ruiz. Dillian's not fought for a European. He wouldn't mention Caballero. He won't mention you his name. Ortez's name he won't mention. He's a coward. He's, he's not a coward. That's the wrong word because he's a boxer, he's a warrior. But he's the can man, and anybody who wants it can get it. But he's not giving him the chance because the, the manoeuvring him and the, the, the getting him through choppy water... And I've got him at the level at Dupus, Washington, people like that. I know that's harsh, but I can't say he's world level, mate. I can't. But where do, where do you put Parker then? Is Parker at that same level? Parker maybe just, yeah, at that level. Yeah, I just, I just think it's really poor, mate, honestly. I see Usyk going through all them. Parker, Dupus, Washington, Dylan White, Chisora. I mean, Chisora, right? How many more times can we, we, we recycle Derek Chisora? He'll get his 10th loss against Dulcet, right? But what we're going to do then, recycling for a pay-per-view with White. It's recycled garbage. Nobody's saying a word. Everybody's just getting on with it. These guys, they're not what they're being bigged up to be. Dylan White does numbers on IFL and is this, is that. He's surrounded by teams of people and legal people and all that. Not fought for a European title yet. Do you, and he's managing fighters as well. Do you think he might... Be trying to trying to be Oscar De La Roya Mayweather too early without having the trinkets because he's got a lot no, of no. in his life, hasn't he? No, so look, look, let, let, let's let, let, let's zero in on what we saw yesterday. We saw a guy who wasn't boxing that badly for a while, right? Yeah. He wasn't. Yeah. By the end of round four, you're just thinking, right? I think Dillian's got this. He just came up against a guy who was too experienced and still had too much pop in his shots. Now, we know what Povetkin's history is with Vada. There wasn't any Vada testing here. Was that a factor? I don't know. But the, the, we have drug testing in these fight camps for a reason. And until we start taking it seriously, we're not going to see 40-year-old men boxing at 40-year-old men. But then... No one wants 40-year-old men to box at 40-year-old men because, like you said, Porky, you can recycle them. You know, look, let's give you an example. Look at Takam, right? Takam's, like, headlining events, Russ. But Takam was getting stopped by Povetkin a decade ago. I know. And we're recycling all of this stuff. So, look, David Hay will happily tell you he bashed Takam about in sparring for fun. It was the easiest sparring he could think of. And now Takam's like a top 10 heavyweight. 
how bad how bad is the standard of heavyweight boxing now that we're saying this? Um, what, do you think David A will come back now he's seen what Povetkin can do? Do you think he might have a, a narrative written about him? Because he's 40 in a couple of weeks, isn't he, David A? When he's 40, I'm 50 the same week. Do you think that David A will come back and try and be in the, in the 40 club? Do you think he could do it? His back won't let him. His what? His spine will not let him. His spine won't let him. All right, then. Yeah. What are you doing for your 50th? What am I doing for my 50th? I don't know. I'll just be happy not to be locked up like all the rest of my other landmark birthdays. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't want to hear interviews going on about Dillian's lack of experience and amateur, uh, on seven amateur fights. No. Do you think that Matchum are pushing that too much this morning and Sky about... Dillian's lack of experience and he's learning on the job. Bell, you kept repeating it in his interviews. He's learning on the job. He's got to be... Then don't charge me 20 quid. Listen, don't yeah. charge me 20 quid. Like, I'm not walking into a restaurant paying 150 quid for food and you tell me the chef's learning on the job. I'm, yeah. like, I'm paying 150 quid for a guy who knows what the hell he's doing. Yeah, So exactly. if, if, Then Sky need to have a conversation with themselves, right? And say, hold on. If... If we're charging people pay-per-view, why are we putting rookies on there? That's what Bell, you call them, right? They're rookies. But yeah. they're not rookies. Like, how, how many fights do you need? Like, Joshua's had more professional fights now. Well, he's, he's closing in on the number that David Hay had. So, and Dylan White's had the same amount of fights as David Hay, or similar. And Dylan White's yeah. WBC number one, and he's saying he wants his title shot. But now he's learning on job he's saying. I mean, what, what yeah. sort of narrative are they going to push out? Why can't they just say, look, you got beat on the night. You've got a rematch. Come again. But that's another thing. Why have we got rematches in fights that are not world titles? Why is it recycled garbage again? Well, not garbage because it was a good fight. But why do we have to watch that again? We had a conclusive finish. The guy was iced. He didn't know what day it was. So why, why do we have to have a rematch now? Why can't we move on? We've seen him get iced. And if he gets iced again, it rematch. It could be another David Price job, couldn't it? I genuinely think Hearn has that in every contract. Yeah, because they want Monopoly, don't they? Yeah, so they either, you either get the rematch clause or he gets options on the winner. That's what happens, I think. Frank does the same thing. Promoters do this because they're trying to keep the money in the stable. Yeah. Because, look, let's be honest, Russ. We talked about this last week, didn't we? Take Joshua out, take Dillian out. Where's the money in boxing? Exactly. And so this is the reality we all have to accept as fans. There's nothing left of interest for us in boxing. It's done. Boxing's finished for us. We've been wasting our time hoping that we get to see Fury Joshua. But even that means nothing now because we know that if Ruiz is on his game, he can beat Joshua. So that means nothing to me. Yeah. I don't, I'd almost want to see Fury versus Ruiz. I think Ruiz is more deserving of that. Um, Wilder's been taken to the cleaners, which is a real shame because, you know, he was, he had the makings of being like a, an era defining champion. But sadly, whatever happened in this camp, he got exposed badly. And there's another example of what happens when you've got the wrong camp around you, especially at the top level. There's a reason why you have to, you have to pick the right people and then you have to trust them with your life because you're literally trusting them with your life. And so that's where we're at right now. We've got Sky going, if Joshua loses again, this whole boxing thing's finished. Dillian White loses again, our pay-per-view model's definitely finished. And I think, we, I think we're in the last two or three years of boxing being a mainstream sport, Russ, if I'm being honest with you. Yeah, I was going to just about say that to you now. Uh, we, we spoke about no credit being given to Povetkin whatsoever. Uh, so who, who's to blame here? Is it Hearn? Is it Sky? Is it Dillian? Or is it Matchroom FC and all the bot accounts and all the fake news that's big, bigged it all up and built this, created this, and I'm going to say myth because Dillian White, for me, is not a world-level fighter. That word, world-level, gets thrown around too easy. He's a man who won a, a vacant British and since then he's been pottering on fighting C-class and B-class guys and a lot of the good wins he's had against old men. His best win is probably Parker, isn't it? Then Rivers. Do you agree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I think you can say that. 
and Parker were life and death and rivers were life and death. And there's an asterisk at the side of the rivers one, isn't there? And we know what we're talking <laughs> about. There is, isn't there? Well, there isn't there. If you piss in a cup, if you piss in a cup and then they put it into two tubes, and the A sample's positive and the B sample, we don't get the results from that, but it's all gone away. What that, that to me is an asterisk next to it. A bit like Flojo who ran 10.49 32 years ago at 100 metres. There's an asterisk next to it. Do you know what I mean? No, she, she was clean, Russ. She was clean, yeah. She right. said she was, so yeah, that's enough. Right, the, the cult following. Obviously, you've seen the... You saw the cricket, didn't you? With uh, Adam Smith bowling fast. Spin bowler Adam Smith with a tennis ball. We've seen all that. We've seen her doing all the batting and all the bowling and all the singing at the karaoke. So we've seen the cult in full swing. All eyes on me, Coogan, no one else. Okay, Eddie. We saw that. But what about the track suits that they had to uh, they had to wear to be part of Team White? What did you think to those Gimp track suits from Gimpville Island? Argos on Gimpville Island. <laughs> what did um, you think to them? Colwell had to have his tucked up, didn't he? On legs and on arms and all that, but he looked like a little keyring, didn't he? <laughs> I wanted to hang him next to me magic trees on me mirror in Merck. <laughs> Do you know what? Um, that sort of stuff looks good if you win. When you lose, um, the internet will have fun with that, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay. So... <laughs> okay, then. Well, look at this then, right? They've got Ruben Tavares, right? And in spreadsheets out to Mark Tibbs in Portugal, right? You've got... Who's the, who's, the, who's, the, who's the other one? Zevier Miller, the trainer, right? He were a corner man. And you've got Colwell on board. So you've got all them there. You've got Dean White on IFL taking training sessions in the bubble, the gym that they've created at Match, at Match Room HQ or whatever. Is the two, look, too many cooks spoil the broth. Is the too many part of Team White now? And then throw the legal guys in and all the people that he's managing. Has he tried to run before he could walk, Dillian? Has he got too big for his boots? And has he just been chopped down to size? Is it karma? Was it a lucky punch? Or is it just a collective thing of, of you know, like the Titanic, where they had lookout and rivets on boat and all that, you know, human, everything all come together. Do you think that's what happened yesterday? So I always like to offer comparisons. So if you look at Joshua's camp, when Joshua goes into camp, McCracken runs that like a tight ship. There's no one in there that doesn't need to be in the room, right? Joshua does his work. What Joshua does in his free time, up to him. But when they're training, no one and nothing gets in the way of that. It's a, it's a well-oiled machine because McCracken's got that authority. He's earned that right to do that. He's got the authority. Is it the same in Team Dillian? I don't know. I'm not close enough. I've heard things about the camp. I know Mark Tibbs ran a pretty tight ship. I don't know what's been happening in Portugal. That will come out over time because South London's a small place. Everything comes out. In I've been in Mark Tibbs' gym, actually, in, in Essex. And Have you? Yeah, Have you? Yeah, did, yeah, you yeah. did you film yeah. any interviews while you're, while you're out there, Paul? Yeah, I did a few interviews, and I like Mark Tibbs. But Mark did Tibbs you? is one of them, like his dad. Right, if there's somebody in the gym and they're over in a bar, Mark's like, oh, mate, how are you, mate? Are you all right? And um, What are you doing here kind of thing? And if you shouldn't be in there, you're not there because... You're not going to say, oh, I've just come to watch my mate train because you won't go to watch your mate on a building site lay bricks. Now, I've had this conversation with Peter Fury and Robert McCracken. You're there to work. It's a job, isn't it? Do you think that Dillian's has kind of become like a bit of a, like a Billy Joe thing? It's more of an entourage than everybody's there to work? Do you think... You could oh, look, 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 look I, I'm not going to lie. Like I've snuck people in to watch David Hay train when I've been in camp. So, it, but that's only because we had something to do in the afternoon. So it just made sense. Look, just come down to the gym, sit for an hour or so, then we'll head off. But I always ask permission. Before I do that, I always ask for permission. And if the answer is no, the answer is no. Yeah, but, but normally what I'm trying like, to make, Terry, is this. If you're on pads, if you're on pads with Trey, so say your boxer's on pads with you, you're taking him in ring on pads, and his mate walks in, for that split second, he'll stop and he'll nod, and then he'll go back to being up pads because train will say, "Come on!" But the concentration's broke in it. Now, if you got that happening two and three times a day over a camp, it could be happening three hundred times, couldn't it? 
And you're concentrating yeah. your throat 300 times and then people shouldn't be there. There's too many Klingons in boxing around people for my liking. Too many people in everybody's ear holes and up everybody's arseholes. That's the bottom line. And I think it has an effect on fighters. The old school trainers don't put up with it. Mick Whale won't put up with it. He won't have he don't have Pete Dossers or hangers on around Josh. And I think there's too many of it. Everybody trying to justify a role and everybody wanting to get everybody wanting to eat at the same table. And that's what it's about, isn't it? They're not gonna say that, are they? And do you think that it's all caught up with Dylan White? He believed his own hype. No. And here's why I say no, Russ. Because that performance wasn't someone who hasn't put who hasn't put the work in, right? He looked in the best shape he's been, and we can talk about that as well. But he was in the best shape I've seen him for a long time. He boxed okay, and he got caught up by, by the better man. My worry is, who was he sparring in camp? So he went all the way out to Portugal. And by the time he was out in Portugal, you couldn't bring people over, obviously, because of the, the COVID thing. Now I almost wonder, would he have been better off staying somewhere like Lucra? where you can bring guys in. So if you needed to bring someone in for sparring, you could, and you could do the testing and the protocols, and you could have probably managed the camp a lot better in the UK. Because as it turned out, we had pretty good weather. So the, the weather wasn't really an issue for training, and plus boxing is an indoor sport anyway. So that's my worry. My worry is actually that he didn't have the, the right caliber of sparring around him. And I think that's what we saw in the fight, that he wasn't able to to adapt he wasn't able to stay sharp and stay clued up yeah all right then uh here's a question for you then we're coming toward uh oh no there's still a few more questions that's right mark tibbs what now for mark tibbs what now for dylan white does dylan white swallow his pride and go back or does he see it through with the new trainer he's got because he's kind of made his bed now and he's got a lie in it hasn't he what do you think He's got all these people around him telling him what to do. I mean, he doesn't strike me as the most intelligent man in the world. He looks to me like he's got a short fuse. If you've got people in your ear holes all the time and up your arse hole, you're going to be thinking, well, where do I go here? I've got this person telling me this, this person telling me that. Eddie Earn will be in his ear. Where does he go now and who trains him? Does he think, I were 11 and 0 with Mark Tibbs, five knockouts, undefeated. Do I go back and say, I made an eight mess of this? A man up and everybody gave him respect. Or does he see it through and go over at Cliff? What does he do? Where's he going now? Mm. Where does he go? Is it a tough one for him? Is there some soul searching needed now as to who's going to train him? Because that's a bad knockout. And we know what happens after bad knockouts like that. Bye-bye to the trainer, innit? And all them around you. Because at first you're angry, then you're upset. And then you look for somebody to blame. And let me tell you this. There will be casualties, I think. What do you think in Team White? I think there's a lot of soul-searching required because, and I've spoken to other boxers about this, and I say, what's your actual ambition in this sport? If it's to be the best person or the best boxer you can be or the best boxer of all time, you have to understand that there are different demands placed upon you. If you want to be the best heavyweight in South London, that's a different story as well. If Dillian really wants to be elite, he has to say to himself, who's the fighter that can take me as I am today and make me elite? Is it Mark Tibbs? Maybe. Is it Dave Caldwell? I haven't seen evidence of that. Is it Xavier Miller? It could be in time. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm never going to shoot Xavier Miller down because he's a coach on the way up. Yeah, but if he loses so, rematch and he's got Miller in corner, he'll regret it for the rest of his life. A lot money has a lot to play in this and business. And let me tell you this, his head will be spinning now, you know. So to be honest, I'd keep Miller, but maybe you do need that Tibbs influence in there as well. I don't know. Dillian probably because it's down to that chemistry. So you'd almost want to sit Mark and Dillian down and go, What was the chemistry like? And if they say we had amazing chemistry, you go back to that. Because it's the chemistry that gets that extra 10-15% out of a fighter. You know, anyone can hold pads and anyone can read from a script and say, hit the bag this many times in this round. Yeah. But when you're a trainer, Russ, you, you hold someone's dreams, their emotions, their feelings, their physical safety. You hold all of these things in your hand, Russ. 
And there has to be a special kind of chemistry that comes with that. And if it's not there, it will never work. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. All right, then, moving on. Uh, first fight of the night was... What it? Kelly versus Cullen. Kelly versus Cullen. Uh, one at judges had it to Cullen. Ian John Lewinson in the mix yet again with a bad decision. He had it a draw. What what were he watching him? I have no idea. But if if anyone knows me, they'll know I like Zach Kelly. We we had Zach Kelly for the ABAs in 2016. Well, not we actually. I wasn't even at the club then. But I did his corner for the for the London finals in the ABAs in 2016. I think he got to the semi-finals that year, and he might have lost out to like Ben Whitaker, who's definitely a special talent, and he's on his way up. Did but you... Zach's, well, oh, sorry, you know, I was to say Zach is as tough as they come. Like he may not look it because you know he looks quite boyish, yeah. but he's as tough as they come mentally. And I just want to see him refine his skills because if he can just tighten a few things up, he'll cause havoc for anyone at 168. Do you think that, uh, obviously, I was looking at some of the forums this morning and some of the people on it, especially from America and stuff like that, they're now saying that England on a matchroom show is like Sauerland's back in the day, you know, when they... Yeah, they, Germany. When they had Abraham and Sven Ocker and they were just doing what they wanted. I mean, I don't know if any hardcore fans have ever watched Abraham versus Miranda 1 on YouTube. Or Robin Reed versus Sven Ocker on YouTube. Go and watch them and you might understand what I'm going on about. Because didn't the FBI investigate them? I think Ocky had to retire, didn't he? Because there were some serious issues going on with judging, weren't there, with Ocker? Yeah. Ocky never gets in Hall of Fame, but he holds the record, doesn't he, for the most titles won in the fewest fights, doesn't he? He's got a better yeah. CV than Carl Zaghi, hasn't he? Well, most people have them. <laughs> no, I'm just saying he's twenty. He's thirty-four and 0, 22 world title fights, undefeated, six stoppages, and you've got twenty-eight on points, all in Germany. So, point I want to make is: Do you think that England, especially on the matchroom shows, is now the new Germany? Stroke Russ, it. Russ, think about this, right? Let's say the IBF said to you, Porky, we just want you to come down as one of our delegates to to this world title fight. We're going to give you a week, all accommodation paid for in Vegas. We're going to give you, we're going to give you about 80, $80 a night, just spending money. You get to meet the fighters. You get to do this. You get to do that. That lifestyle becomes addictive, right? Thank if you're you. just, gen yeah, if you're just generally a bus driver or prison screw. That's why That's I have a with oh, did not it? You know what, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. So, so if I'm a judge and Hearn's saying to me, mate, I really like your judging. We're thinking of getting you on the on the next Joshua fight in the UK. I'm giving a match from friendly decision, and subconsciously I'm doing that because yeah. But I'm Ian thinking, John Lewison, right? He's been there every weekend for four weekends, and they've been paid every day, aren't they? They've been on a good do. Do you think that their bias then comes into it to 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 give Eddie Earns fighter a a helping hand on the scorecard? Because it's going to play into effect, isn't it? Uh, it is, but I think I think the deeper reason is you just love the you love being on a jolly, like yeah. just in the same way that the Sky pundits never criticise fighters because they go, if I criticise Joshua, I'm not going to get on the next Joshua pay per view, but well, I want to be part of that. Carl Froch criticised Joshua on IFL, and he's not been on any TV broadcast for the last four weeks. It might not be because of that. It could be. Because he might be on holiday in Portugal or what, I don't know. But he, uh, Carl Froch has done every pay per view for the last five years, only six years, and that's the only one he hadn't done last night. So I, I don't, I don't know what's gone on. But is nobody allowed to say it? Do, do they have to go with the narratives? Yep. Except, 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 it was weird because Johnny Nelson veered off script yesterday, right? With the first you know, the result. Yeah, so so if you look at what Sky do, they're really clever. So th they almost give instructions because they get Anna Warhouse to speak first. Yeah, she gives you a really leading question. So she'll say something like, "So guys, don't you think she's ad libbing Katie for him, isn't she? She's ad libbing. Not even ad libbing. She's she's guiding the discussion. So once yeah. she says, 
yeah, that was a great performance by Katie Taylor. Do you think she deserved to win? You've almost, so now the first thing I need to say is I don't think that was a great performance. Yeah. But you don't want to say that because then you look like the guy that's deviating off script. So they yeah. get Anna Woolhouse to, to shut some of the doors so you can't even talk about it. But yeah. Johnny was like, no, 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 I've got to talk about it. So fair play to Johnny for not being the company man last night. Yeah, only because I've been digging him out. He can't bear it when I put him in helmets, Johnny. But he gets votes. I mean, he's in top four for end of month already. He's there every I, month. I, I don't know if you saw the interview with Sky. And he was talking about how much like, he, he struggles with the helmet of the month. He goes, look, I just wish Porky would give me a fair crack of things. <laughs> hey, let me tell you this, mate. When helmets of the month comes out this month, they all better get ready at that Ingle gym. They'll all be watching it on the phones in between sessions. Oh, mate, do you see Dominic? Do you see him start, start da dangling the hook in the water? You know what? Do you see Dominic Ingle start dangling the hook in the water? Ah, oh, Dillian, you're really unlucky, mate. Really sorry. Ah, uh, you know, just a bit more experience. And I think you Is that what he's saying on Twitter then? Yeah. Let me tell you about him, right? Do you know all he's doing there? He's putting his, he's putting his app into training. That's all he's doing. They're just... Yeah, no. Open for bread crumbs. They were open for crumbs. Listen, he learned off his dad, didn't he? The bit, listen, it's listen, it's an institution up there, mate. That's what they do. I've seen Ben Davidson coming out. Ben Davidson, it was. He come on out IFL and he said, Dylan White's still making the same mistakes that he made against Joshua, even now, and he's not eyeing them out. Oh, is he, is he some expert or something? Because Fury got dropped twice on his shift and got flogged by Otto Wallin. So, how was he in it? And, and then sacked. So, how was he an expert all of a sudden? What has he done with anybody from scratch? He's just piggybacked onto people that are already world level. That's all. How was he an expert to say that Dylan White's not correcting mistakes from five years ago? Who's he? Do you know what it is, Russ? I'll tell you what's Cub Scout. i tell you what's been happening in boxing. Um, I was talking to a friend of mine, Eddie, about this because he's a trainer. And we were talking about it. These new, these new kids, they're basically analysts, right? So they go on YouTube and they watch like 10 Povetkin fights. They do all this analysis and they come up with these numbers. And so they start talking numbers and people just assume that these guys know what they're talking about in a boxing sense. They, they mess up when it comes to actually having to manage a fighter in sparring or in a fight where they don't have a clue. Anything that deviates from the script that they had planned out and they're lost. I don't know if Ben Davidson's in that category. We'll find out with Josh Taylor. But there are a lot of these guys coming through now, these kind of analysts, and they do their stupid little videos on, on Twitter where they break down fights and they break down like a little seven-second clip and they go, well, look, look at what I've seen. And they just think they're smarter than everyone else. But they don't have a clue because for me, you're a good trainer when you win things. That's the start and end of it. Yeah. If you don't win things, you're not a good trainer. We can all pal people up, can't we? Like Pox and pal Clinton Woods in. It's all, pal, oh, it's all right palling Clinton Woods up when he's British Commonwealth European champion and, and, and he's mandatory for Roy Jones. Yeah, it's all, it's all right pa, 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 palling, palling people up then. The, the, the heavy lifting's been done, hasn't it? Tyson <laughs> Fury, the heavy lifting were done by Huey Fury Sr., the late Huey Fury Sr., and Peter Fury. They'd done all the heavy lifting, right, before Ben Davidson come on scene and Sugar Hill and all this. The heavy lifting had been done. Now, Dillian White, I forgot who trained him before Jonathan Banks. Didn't he train out of Miguel's or TKO? Chris, Chris Oker. Chris Oker. And then he went to who? Jonathan Banks. Did oh, you Jonathan Banks? Involved, eh? If he went to Banks, I think it was just for, like, one fight. And then, obviously, that didn't work out. And then it was... Mark Tibbs. Then it was Tibbs. But, but look, I feel for Chris Oko because Chris did a lot for Dillian. And Chris Oko doesn't get the, the credit he deserves for actually, you know, guiding Dillian. Because, look, I remember Dillian when he used to spar guys like Ian Lewis and Dom Akinladi. And he wasn't that good back in 2008, 2009. And I'm not saying that to be disrespectful. It's true. Chris Oko got his arms around him, started to iron off the rough edges, and then, you know, he gave Mark Tibbs a far better version of Dillian to work with than he would have done otherwise. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's true. But like, like I just said there, there's too many people. Everybody's an expert, aren't they, all of a sudden? And it's like, are, are we experts for criticising it? No, because I'd like to think that I'm, I'm just going to tell it straight. I'm not a trainer. I'm not a fighter. 
looking at it from the outside, everybody is all of a sudden, oh, you should do this, you should do that. It's like me with this channel. I people say, oh, you need to do this, you need to do that. Well, you go and do it then. You, who, who's going to pay for it? Me, am I going to keep flopping out all the time? Or Kevin? Who's, people, everybody's an expert after the fact. And maybe we're out of order even talking about it like this, but I'm just trying to guide people, right? Dylan White, for me, right, he's a slugger that's been moulded. He's, he's got a manufactured profile and he fits into that slot that earns, earns people money. But don't tell me that you're badly done to buy governing bodies when you've knocked back a fight for four championship belts at Wembley for five and a half million. And you're arguing about the rematch clause. It's a bit like this with John Fury, Mickey Fio thing. Everybody's an expert, aren't they? But the main thing is they've not fought, have they? So I ain't got time for it now. I've, I've done my bit. There's, there's always going to be an excuse about where they're going to fight or when. And it's a bit like Dylan White. He, he's all of a sudden a victim, Terry. But really, the reality is he's had opportunities to be in the mix and he, had, he hadn't took them, has he? Because they were risky fights. Why not just admit that and make out, look, you're Euro level. He's a Euro level guy, mate. He's Euro level. He's not world level. We're all getting carried away. Is Paul Smith world level? 100%. He's the best super middleweight. I think, I think Paul Smith would have beaten Froch. No, listen, Terry, talk serious. Paul Smith for DeGale Groves, Andre Ward, Abraham Twice, and Zuga. Right? That's six world champions he's been in with Paul Smith. And yeah, he went, three Hall of Famers. Yeah, and he went naught and six. But he's on one of his last interviews, he was saying, I'm still world level. He won a vacant British against Tony Dodson, right? So he never won a European, but Paul Smith's telling us he's world level. And Dylan White yeah. won a vacant British, never won a European, and never fought for a world title. But we're all to believe he's world level because he does numbers in IFL. And that's, I'm the still with social, that's the problem with social media. You are. I still don't understand why Crotch never fought Paul Smith when they're both available. Paul, well, Paul Smith probably seen Froch pinging his brother Callum around EIS and probably thought, I don't fancy any of that. I don't know. He, he was never in the mix to fight Carl Froch. I, 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 I think Froch ducked him. Fro Froch would do him now, wouldn't he? Froch is the hardest man in the world, mate. Best super... <laughs> Got more world title wins. More, he's beat more world champions at super middle than anybody. Go check on box. But, but, but never beat the Gale. So I don't really take the career seriously right, if you don't have a win over the Gale. Because Groves beat the Gale, didn't he? And Froch knocked Groves out twice at the end. Well, well, we're, well. We're, going off, we're going off key here, Terry. Let's get uh, <laughs> back to the nature at hand. <laughs> no, 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 but, well, no, Russ, what, one thing I did want to say is we're looking at Dillian now and he might be our, our version of Ken Norton. You know, when you look at Ken Norton, Ken, Ken Norton was always there or thereabouts, but was never really a world champion. I think he fought for the vacant he belt. Got, he got upgraded to WBC champion, didn't he? And he, and he but never, he never fought for it. Homes, eh? He's, but he never won a belt. He was given to No, him. he was given a belt. Well, Dillian, well, Nathan Cleverly were given a belt. Ricky Burns were given a belt. Dennis Levedef were given a belt. Enzo Macarinelli. We can go on forever who's been given belts. Scott Quigg. They're all handed them, aren't they? Upgraded. It's the name. No, but that's my no, 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 no. That's no, no, that's my point, Russ. Billy might be that guy. Ali, didn't he? So that irons out a lot of things, doesn't he? he could dine out on Say that. Again. Ken Norton beat Ali, didn't he? In one of them three fights. Yeah, yeah. But that, that, so that's my point is you. Ken Norton is that guy we talk about in the seventies. We go, yeah, Ken Norton, Ken Norton. But when you look at his record, it's not amazing. So eh, it's all right. It's not great. I think Dillian might be that guy where yeah. his his name will be bigger than his achievements. I'm worried for you. Yeah, because of IFL. Dillian, Dillian is the Ken Norton of the 2020s, isn't he? 50 years later, he, 40, 50 years later. He's the Ken Norton of our day. Now, that's not a bad moniker to, to, to have, is it? But the point I want to make is, I think he started to believe his own hype. Nobody dare say out to him because he's very sullen and he's surrounded by all these people who think they're rock hard. So nobody dare say out. But I'll say it, mate. I don't think he's world level. I think he's Euro level. And I think a good fight for him would be Cabell or Yui Fury. He's in that sort of mix now. He's been beat by Povetkin. Yui were beat by Povetkin, but 
you is seven years younger than Dylan, isn't he? So you has got time on his hand, but I'd like to see you and and Dylan. I don't want to see Chisora against Dylan after Usek beats Chisora. I don't want to see that because it's recycled rubbish yet again. I mean that people were even talking about Taylor Pursuing having a third one. I mean, w w how many more times can we keep going back with re repeat, fade away, repeat, fade away? It's just repeat, 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 isn't it? I'm getting fed up of it. And everything I've been saying for months and months and months coming true now, I feel like David Icke. <laughs> <laughs> you like that one, Tell? Uh, a couple more yeah. questions for you here. Uh, White got iced bad, so how is it a rematch for me? Rematches should be for world title fights. Is it now a call? It's in the contract, that's why. Yeah, I know, yeah. Okay, so we're going to fight again. Uh, judging. Judging and bias and YouTubers that don't ask the right questions. What do you think to that, Terry? Uh, the, listen, too many people expect Coogan to be the Jeremy Paxman of boxing, right? Too many people expect Rob Tebbett to be the, the John Suchet of boxing. They're not, man. They're guys that never got girls in school. Now they're on the internet. Now, you know, they're a bit famous. People know who they are. They get their ego stroke. That's what they live for. They don't care about what the fans think. They just care about getting their ego stroke. And that's fine. Listen, if you want to do that, it's not for me to judge you. The people who deliver the truth and say it like it is are guys like you, Porky. Like I keep saying to people, like, I see the comments here, right? But how many people who comment on this, how many people who watch this, share this? Yeah. Copy the link to this video, share it then, because we need to get Porky up to like 10K real subscribers because only then do the, do the, the real boxing fans, the boxing fans who are tired of paying 20 quid for dribble, only then do those guys have a voice. Yeah. So you, it, it, it's on everyone that listens to this yeah. to share it and just go, look, this is where the truth in boxing is happening. It's not happening on IFL. It's not happening on boxing social. It's not happening on behind the gloves. It's just not. Yeah, it's not happening. No, because the, them people are making livings out of it. I don't make a living out of this. They do. And they don't want to rock their boat. I'm fortunate in other areas, aren't I? But they're not. But don't tell me that you're boxing people when you're not asking about VADA testing, stub up, and bad judging and bias. And it, it, it's a vicious circle, isn't it? It's a bit, and I, I feel sorry for Coogan because I sometimes think he gets a bit of stick off people because he's caught in middle, isn't he? Do you know? He's, do you know what I mean? Kind of thing. He's caught in middle of trying to be famous, trying to get a few quid and do a good job. And let me tell you this: it's an hard slog, you know, humping cameras around up and down the country. It's an hard slog, mate. Honestly, especially if you go through London like I do and forget to get them pass yeah. things. <laughs> what? Nah. End it with letters off for Amir Khan's mate. Is it? No, not Amir. Sadiq Khan. Anyway, that's another story. But getting back to this then, do you feel that the Terry Harper and Steffi Bull, how we had it rammed down his throat, and then they didn't do no interviews on IFL, then we've, they've gone down to Matchroom to sign a contract on the fishing day, and IFL are there, and they've still not gone on IFL or done any interviews, and Shannon Courtney's not done none. And up to now, we're in afternoon Sunday. Dylan White's not done none on IFL. Do you feel that Coogan's not forcing issue to bother him? Or is somebody saying to him, don't push interviews on these because we haven't had the right results? What do you think? Because they can't have it both ways, can they? Um, look, so the one I can speak about, because I, I kind of, we, we, we have mutual friends, is Shannon Courtney. And I know she took the defeat badly, but I've seen her take these defeats badly before, especially in the amateurs. And I feel for her because if you remember, Shannon Courtney was very visible on social media, very vocal. So when you're vocal like that, when you then taste defeat, it's not acceptable to the boxing fan for you to just switch off to social media. That, that's what angers boxing fans more than anything. It's like Anthony Fowler. When Fowler lost to Fitzgerald, at least he fronted up immediately. You know, he fronted up and he took the stick that he knew was coming his way. And so people grew to like Fowler. I think Shannon Courtney just shut down. Terry Harper did the same thing. They shut down because they weren't happy with the result and they knew that people would start talking. But these are the same people you're going to want to 
to, to buy your next fight. So I think box, boxers have to learn. If you're going to use social media for your own benefit, you can't go missing when it doesn't go your way. It's yeah. as simple as that. All right. Um, that's, what, that's my take on it. It's In terms of like, Terry Harper, look, she got a, a lucky decision against Jonas as far as I'm concerned. I found it interesting that Jonas is now talking about fighting Katie Taylor, um, which would be interesting because, you know, they're rivals from the amateurs. And, you know, I, I don't know where Jonas has suddenly discovered this mythical power from, but fair play to it. I really like Natasha Jonas. So I think Katie Taylor's there to be taken out by someone who knows what they're doing. I thought she was, I thought she looked terrible yesterday. I thought she looked like she'd been boxing for too long. She looked like someone, and, and do you remember when Sugar Ray Leonard fought Terry Norris? Yeah. And when you watch that fight, you can tell Sugar Ray knows what to do, but he was doing it like a, like a fifth of a second too late. And then that's a sign that maybe you've seen better days. And I, I saw the same thing in Katie Taylor last night. Do you feel that uh, Pursum won last night then? Yes. Yeah, I thought she won. Like I thought she won six to four. Yeah, six four. Yeah, the he, the Victor Laughlin, we, we had it by two rounds. He had it by five. So how is it a seven round swing? What fight were Victor Laughlin watching? Should he be allowed to ref again or judge again? Does he need to be investigated? Does he and John Lewis need investigating? The problem with judging is as long as it's it's ten nine ten nine, you're always going to get that. I think you need a scale. I genuinely think you need a scale, and you should be able to score a fighter anything from zero to ten, right? Yeah, you could do it ten, ten eight and a half round, couldn't you? If it's a good round. No, nah, I, I I think you've just got to rate people, right? So Porky, let's say you do twelve rounds against Big John Fury. Yeah. Well, maybe. Sorry, sorry. Let's, well, let's Fury say you get to round three. Rounds with me, he couldn't do three rounds. Have you seen him have bag? What? Well, I'm saying nothing man, because you, you and him I'm clearly. I'm supposed to be fighting today for John Fury. I ain't got a problem with John Fury, but I've seen him on bag, so <laughs> he's not. He ain't got twelve rounds in him. Now, if you want to say me and John Fury have a three rounds, yeah, I'll probably get my head punched in. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, no, I so... can't do twelve rounds, and John, I know John Fury can't. Even though I seen him on an interview the other day saying he'd just done a ten mile run in an hour. Frotch didn't do that. He were 35 minutes for six and a half mile. So John Fury, he's running 10, 10 mile in an hour. So that means 20 mile in two hours. He's nearly a marathon runner, John Fury, at that pace, isn't he? I, I believe that. 56 year old. No, no, but he's always been fast, though. Do you, do you remember, like, he, he auditioned for Superstars, did the 110.4. Who did? Big John Fury. Big John Fury, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, who could do could do thirty five pull ups? Moving on, right? Uh, just a couple more questions now for you. Uh, Chris Conger, when I started with Dennis, April two thousand fifteen, do you remember me getting in touch with you and saying, Terry, send me a list of kids that are going to turn over, and uh, I'll put it to Dennis. You sent me a list. I got some other list off other people, but and I told Dennis about him. Do you remember Chris Conger? Yeah. There were another kid as well, weren't there? What was his name? I mean, I can't even remember that list. I remember Chris Conger's name, obviously, because it's a, it's a, not a hard name to forget, is it, Conger? And he's now 12-0 and 0 and doing well, isn't he? So if Dennis would have listened to us, he would have had a good kid there, wouldn't he? But his argument is, he's from London, he's not going to do no tickets in Sheffield. So that's it, isn't it? That's what you're up against, but, but, isn't it? But the thing is, I, and I say this to Den all the time, you have to pick one person where you say, Forget ticket sales, right? Yeah, this, put, yeah. this guy's good enough to take it all the way. Now, Congo fought Luther Clay. I like Luther. Luther's trained by my friend Adam Martin. Adam's a good guy. Uh, and I was hearing a lot of good noises about Luther. And I think, I think Luther's a good 147 guy. Yeah. Um, just don't put him in with someone who's six foot, six foot one. Yeah. And I think, yeah, Chris just used his jab and he used his skills pretty well just to break down Luther. I think Luther probably struggled because he was quite heavy when Fight Camp was announced. So there's a lot of energy going into dropping the weight. And I think he's learned that lesson. But I thought that was a really good fight. I thought that was the best fight of Fight Camp. And like my, my benchmark is you had two people relatively evenly matched on paper. 
and the fight leads somewhere because one of those two guys now, well, whoever wins that, well, whoever won that, sorry, has a legitimate shout for the British. So that means it's progression for both guys. Yeah. And young, hungry guys fighting each other is what we look for in boxing. Yeah. Yeah, all right then. Well, finishing off then, it's been a good, good hour. Uh, if Joshua loses against Pulev, and it's quite possible, will there be a rematch? Oh, uh, no, no, no. Because, yeah, exactly. It's a mandatory. So there is no rematch clause. Right. Do you see, in a year's time, Eddie Hearn still being in boxing? Because if you scratch the surface, it's not as attractive as Rota as what he's making out, is it? Now, he's the number one guy in world boxing, but when you... Is he? Oh, no, oh, no, no, no. Wait, wait, stop. Look. Well, promoter. Really? You'd have to say promoter, wouldn't you? Come on. Really? I think he is. He could talk. He could sell... Doesn't, does, doesn't have Danny Garcia. Doesn't have Errol Spence. Doesn't have Keith Thurman. Doesn't have Manny Pacquiao. No, but actual promoting what he's got. He's the number one promoter. He might not have the best stable, but actual promoting-wise, he, he just don't shut up, does he? He's, uh... Well, no, no. Well, that's different. No, no. What you're saying there is he's a talker. Yeah. Now, for me, you're, you're a promoter. You're a good promoter when all your guys are making good money. No one, no one's beating Al Heyman for that at the moment. Nobody, not even Bob. Al Heyman is making sure his guys eat. That's a good promoter. They're all eating, they're all sure. learning well, aren't they? Yeah, and they're all look at their profiles, man. Like you know, Errol Spencer's known to non-boxing people now as well. He does it the intelligent way. Hearn, Let's be honest, right? If Eddie Hearn was in a coma tomorrow, and I don't really, I don't hope that happens at all, but if Hearn was in a coma tomorrow, Matchroom stops. Oh, yeah, yeah, without a shadow of a doubt. Without a shadow of a doubt. Because he's a workaholic, isn't he? But do you think his stable could be weak if Dylan White went elsewhere? For example, Frank Warren's going to throw a spanner in works this week. He can't help himself, old Bricktop. But I just think there could be offers put to White this week to take him in a new direction because we could be seeing Dylan White fight Povetkin in December, beat him, and then he could still be froze out for another 18 months. And what's he going to do? Who's he going to fight after that? Chisora, is he just going to keep picking up pay-per-views that are not world titles? And what narrative could this put on it then? I said okay. to him, you know, he'd never would fight for a world title, not while he's fighting B and C class. Okay, so who do you sign with? You can only be signed with Bob because Bob's got the other belt. Al Heyman hasn't got a heavyweight belt. So who are you going to sign with? So he, he's stuck in limbo because Joshua's got four belts and Fury's got the other two. So he's stuck in limbo, isn't he? Yeah. William White, as the pay-per-view guy, like Chisora, picking up a few quid but never going to get a title shot. That's not a bad thing considering where he's come from. But don't tell me about it's about belts and legacy and this and that. When, when you'd knock him back four belts at Wembley because of a rematch clause and getting millions, don't tell me, don't push that narrative on me because you're caught out telling lies. You see where I'm coming from? Yeah. Uh, and, and the only people that lap it up are the casuals, and that's 90% at market, and it's so wrong. Everybody's being lied to. Russ, yeah, go on. Mate, uh, ultimately, this is a business more than it will ever be a sport. Yeah, I know. That. Yeah, I know. I love that, yeah. And we have to just make our peace with that. What because, about you know, Dylan White against Joe Joyce? I mean, you you won't you won't say he beat Joe Joyce on that performance yesterday, would you? What about Dylan yeah. White to Bar? You are. Why would you take that? Like, look how many miles Dillian's had just in the last two or three years. How many miles his body's had? Miles on clock, on it now, on it. It's like cheese with Eggington. They're looking at December for that, aren't they? They're saying it could be a chief support for Dylan against Povetkin. Cheeseman Eggington, got, got, what are they going to be like when they're 30? No, we're just joking oh. like that now. <laughs> oh, they sound like Joe Frazier and Riddick Bowe and Meldrick Taylor. So, oh. what, what's going to happen to, to Cheeseman and Eggington? I mean, I mean do, do you know what I mean? I, I, I worry for them. But they're caught in the cult, aren't they? And that's the problem. So... All right, then. Well, listen, I've enjoyed it, Terry. It's been uh, emotional. Yeah, man, you know, and uh, as we always say, people just need to keep supporting boxing. So I'm now going to upload this and then I'm going to 
check on the helmet votes because we're going international helmet this month for August. So get your vote <laughs> in. You can vote for anybody in the world, not just British, but everybody just wants to vote for British people because they just annoy them so much, don't they? <laughs> <laughs> it's so annoying, but I'm such a ruthless little rascal, aren't I? So, all right then, Terry. Well, listen, it's been great. I've really enjoyed it, mate. Really. And yeah. uh, I will catch up with you tomorrow sometime. All right, my friend? All right, buddy. You take care. Take care. Cheers, Terry. Right. Don't have night. Keep on trucking. All right. <laughs> Well, I enjoyed that, and I hope I, you've enjoyed that as much as me. Don't forget to like and subscribe and leave a comment, good or bad. don't really matter because I only get to hear about the good ones. Somebody moderates it, but leave a comment, and then everybody else can interact with you, can't they? And if it's somewhat worth reading, I might even jump on myself and reply, but I don't have time. But like I said, like and subscribe and share it as well. If you want to share this video, I don't know how you do it, if you do it on your WhatsApp, so share it amongst your pals and let's grow the movement. All right. Why do we press stop on this? I, don't know. I wish I'd have gone to school. I think that's it there.